Hello, uh, my name is Alex Delzell, and I am going to be speaking about this paper titled Mind the Gap, Achieving a Super Grover Quantum Speedup by Jumping to the End uh, as part of Stock 2023. And uh, this is based on joint work with a few collaborators, um, Nico Pancotti, Earl Campbell, and Fernando Brandao, where Nico, Fernando, and I are uh, at the AWS Center for Quantum Computing, and Earl's at River Lane. The subject of this uh, talk is quantum algorithms for combinatorial optimization. Um, so here we have a classical cost function H, which is a function of n bit inputs. Um, and our goal is to find a bit string Z star that minimizes the cost function H. Um, and we call this minimum value E star, which we assume we we know ahead of time. So we, we make two assumptions in this talk, which are not um, strictly required uh, uh, in the paper, but um, we'll simplify things, which is that uh, Z star is a unique minimizer of H and that we know the value of E star ahead of time. So an example of such a cost function is a max E3 lin2 instance, such as this, where the value of H is given by some polynomial in the bits of the bit string Z, where each polynomial has the same degree, degree three. Now, how do we solve such a problem with a quantum computer? Um, well, we can run Grover's algorithm on it, which allows us to search over these two to the n inputs in time uh, O star of two to the 0 0.5 n, where O star is suppressing uh, polynomial and n factors. And this is a, a really nice improvement um, in that uh, we kind of don't have to exploit any structure in the problem at all to achieve it. But unfortunately, it's unlikely to accomplish a practical quantum advantage um, by itself. Um, due to the fact that quantum computers will have slower clock speeds, they'll be faced with errors that need correcting, um, leading to further overheads, and also that uh, Grover's algorithm is uh, uh, an inherently serial algorithm, whereas many of the classical competing algorithms are highly parallelizable. So although there's an asymptotic speedup, uh, in practice, we don't expect quadratic to be sufficient to deliver kind of game-changing improvements uh, for actual problems. So the goal of this talk then is to ask the question if we can go beyond the runtime of Grover's algorithm. So we'd like to um, uh, give an algorithm that runs in time two to the 0 0.5 minus C times N for some C that's independent of N. So you know two to the 0 0.4 N or something like this. Um, ideally, we would uh, get something like two to the 0 0.25 N, which would represent a quartic speedup compared to exhaustive enumeration. Um, because uh, in these previous analyses, it was kind of seen that if one had a quartic asymptotic speedup, then uh, the overheads would line up in such a way that would allow for a practical quantum advantage to be much more reasonable. But of course, we know that because Grover's algorithm is optimal in the black box setting, that um, we're going to have to exploit some structure in H. We're going to have to open up that black box if we want to um, make such um, an achievement. And we also know that if we want to truly go beyond the runtime of, uh, of, of a quadratic improvement, the effect that we use to achieve this super Grover performance has to be inherently quantum. Because if we just use some sort of classical technique um, that can be equally used on the quantum algorithm and the classical algorithm, then uh, we won't actually go beyond quadratic. You know, We'll just speed up both, but the relationship between them will be the same. So as a warm up, we can think about the quantum adiabatic algorithm, which is a, an algorithm that's often been studied for combinatorial optimization. And in theory, it could go beyond uh, a quadratic speedup and go beyond the runtime of Grover. Um, and how does this work? Uh, we take a Hamiltonian H sub B, where B is a parameter that goes from zero to one. Um, and we evolve slowly from B equals zero to a very large value of B. Um, so here, when b equals 0, you can see that all you have is the first term, this x over n term, which we call the transverse field, given by the sum of all the poly x operators. And then when b is large, um, the second term dominates, and we have only our cost function h normalized by its optimal value e star. Um, so of course, this uh, means that at large values of b, we can kind of ignore the transverse field and the ground state of our um, Hamiltonian will be the string z star that we'd like to find. So we can look at the spectrum of this Hamiltonian hb as a function of b. 
And uh, we can see that uh, at the beginning, there's going to be a sizable spectral gap. And the ground state will be the plus state, which is easy to prepare. And at the end, there will also be a sizable spectral gap. And the ground state will be the state Z star, um, which is the one we're looking for. So the adiabatic algorithm says if we go slowly enough, then we'll stay in the ground state and we'll prepare the state that we'd like to find. But the issue is that the runtime required for the adiabatic algorithm to work is related to the minimum spectral gap that is encountered along this path. And as this cartoon suggests, there could be one or more uh, avoided level crossings where the spectral gap becomes very small. In fact, it could become exponentially small or even, or even worse along this path, um, suggesting that the runtime of the adiabatic algorithm is exponentially large. But uh, kind of more importantly, it's also hard to analyze. So uh, it's very kind of hard to put bounds on the spectral gap along this path uh, in general. So we don't really know how fast the adiabatic algorithm will run in practice, and it's kind of uh, ultimately kind of a heuristic thing that we'll have to wait and see once we get a quantum computer. But we'd like better evidence that uh, this algorithm will work or that some algorithm will work. So we really want a rigorous proof um, that uh, that we can go beyond Grover's algorithm. And to do that, um, we would present a new algorithm that uh, for which we can say something um, of that kind of statement. And uh, it can be understood as taking the adiabatic algorithm and applying two simple modifications. So the first modification is that when we look at this Hamiltonian HB, uh, where we interpolated from B equals 0 to a very large value of B, we're going to change the diagonal term that includes the cost function in a slight way. So we're going to, instead of just putting H directly into the cost function, we're going to apply a filter to it and then put it into the cost function. Now, what is this filter? It's a piecewise linear filter which um, zeroes out most of the cost values. So most of the time, if you plug in a value z uh, into this filter, you're just going to get 0. But if you happen to put in a z that it already lives in one of the deep cost valleys of this cost function, so it has a cost value close to minus 1, then um, this filter kind of minimally changes it. right? It, it just uh, it, it applies a linear, a, a, a linear factor to it. Um, but the structure that's going on within these deep valleys is preserved. Um, so we, why do we do this? Um, we do it for kind of subtle technical reasons to um, be able to control the spectrum of this Hamiltonian HB in a way that uh, wouldn't be possible without uh, applying the filter. And then the second thing that we do, which is what inspires the title of the, the paper, is that we, um, we don't want to deal with these nasty avoided level crossings. Um, uh, so instead, we just jump to the end of the algorithm. We jump over the avoided level crossings and kind of terminate the algorithm um, before uh, we were planning to in the original version of the adiabatic algorithm. So what do I, what do I mean by that? Um, I mean, if we take this cartoon uh, of our avoided level crossings, we're going to um, start in the, in the plus state, and we're going to kind of go up to a point uh, B that's beneath this first avoided level crossing. And once we get there, we're going to jump all the way to the end of the algorithm. And we can do this first part either adiabatically, if we'd like, or we can just jump straight from the plus state to this intermediate point, and then jump again from the intermediate point to this final point. So as kind of suggested by the cartoon, the, the, the first jump is short and kind of succeeds with high probability. But the second jump is long and actually succeeds with very low probability. Um, but the idea is that we can kind of repeat the algorithm, or we can do amplitude amplification on top of the algorithm to boost that probability, and we'll achieve uh, a result that's slightly better than Grover's algorithm. And here I'll note that both of these ideas, um, modifying the cost function and jumping um, to the end over the, the place where the gap is small, appeared previously in Hastings' short path algorithm uh, in 2018, which kind of formed the inspiration for this algorithm. But the uh, way that we've implemented these ideas is kind of dual to how they were implemented in the short path algorithm. So um, whereas we've modified the second term in this Hamiltonian by applying a filter, Hastings suggested modifying the first term with a filter. And where we've done a short jump and then a long jump, uh, Hastings did a long jump and then a short jump. So um, kind of uh, the way we do it, uh, you get a slightly different analysis, and we're able to prove a few more things. But the idea um, is kind of definitely inspired by this other algorithm. So how do we actually perform these jumps? And how does the algorithm actually go? Um, I'd like to kind of carefully explain that. Um, so remember, the input to our algorithm is the cost function h, or some description of it. 
the optimal value E star that we're trying to achieve, uh, a choice eta, which determines our filter, um, and also a choice B, which determines how far we're going to go before we're going to jump to the end. Um, and then there's just three steps. Uh, first, we prepare the plus state. Second, we jump to this intermediate point. And how do we do that? Uh, we take our Hamiltonian HB, for which this intermediate point is the ground state, and we perform phase estimation on the initial state being the plus state. And this will affect a, a measurement of the energy of HB. And as long as we are able to kind of distinguish the ground state from the first excited state, then phase estimation will allow us to project onto the state psi B. Um, this may not always succeed, so we have to do amplitude amplification to boost the success probability of this working. And then uh, finally, we'll jump from this intermediate point to the endpoint Z star. And this is equivalent to just measuring in the computational basis, uh, achieving uh, which gives us kind of an output Z, and then checking whether we've gotten a Z for which H of Z equals E star. Because remember, we, we know ahead of time what E star is. And then, of course, we can wrap this inside amplitude amplification to kind of boost the probability of actually successfully jumping to Z star. And then once we've done this, uh, we can just output the answer Z star, and we've solved the problem. So what is the runtime of this algorithm? Um, so we have to impose a condition in order to be able to bound the runtime. And this condition is basically just saying that there's still a spectral gap at the value of B that we've chosen uh, in our algorithm. Uh, so formally, we say that the first excited energy of this HB must be at least negative 1 plus 1 over n. This is important because the ground state is going to be at most negative 1. So this would suggest that there's at least a gap of 1 over n, which is only polynomially small. Um, uh, and this means that when we do our phase estimation, we're only going to have a polynomial uh, contribution from phase estimation. So that's where this poly n will come from in the runtime. And now there are two terms on top of that, which come from amplitude amplification. Um, and uh, these correspond to the two different jumps. So when we're jumping from the plus state to this intermediate state psi b, we have to do amplitude amplification um, a number of times that scales like the inverse of the overlap between those two states. And then when we're jumping from psi b to z star, we again pay an inverse in the overlap between those two states. And because the first jump is small and the second jump is large, we'll be able to show that this uh, first term is actually uh, very small. It's only a constant amount of amplitude amplification we have to do. But in the second case, it's an exponentially large amount of amplitude amplification. However, the important central thing that we're able to show is that the amount of amplitude amplification, this overlap for the second term, is slightly better than what would be achieved in Grover's algorithm. So this is what ends up giving us the speed up, at least for specific cases. So uh, we'll kind of state that state that soon. OK, so now, uh, before we move on to um, what we've shown, uh, I'd like to just kind of give a bit more intuition about what's going on in the algorithm. Um, so the idea is to iterate between these three different states. The first state we start at is the plus state. And this state is uh, an extended state because it has amplitude across all of the bit strings across the entire Hilbert space. Uh, it's also uni it's also uniform, right? It has uniform amplitude everywhere. And we jump to this intermediate state, which is in the same phase as the plus state. And what I mean by that is it's you know the gap has not closed yet. It still looks kind of like the plus state. In fact, it has high overlap with the plus state. Um, it's still extended across the entire Hilbert space, but it's not uniform anymore. Um, in fact, the uh, some of the amplitudes are actually exponentially larger than the other ones, but it still has kind of a lot of amplitude uh, everywhere. And then finally, we jump from this intermediate state to a localized state where all of the amplitude is localized onto the state Z star. So when we go from the extended state to the localized state, we've crossed over a phase transition into a different phase, which is kind of you know uh, evidenced by the fact that the gap has gotten small in between those two points. Um, so the idea of the algorithm can be um, expressed as saying, like, we go up to the phase transition, but not across it. And then we just jump to the end once we kind of go up to it. And we're able to kind of leverage uh, a little bit of gains that we can get by kind of going close to the phase transition before um, before going across. OK, so with that in mind, uh, I'd like to state the specific things that we can prove about our algorithm. So here, we're looking at runtimes that go like 2 to the some number a times n, where Grover would go like 2 to the 0 0.5 times n. And for specific problems like the three-set problem, uh, we're able to show an improvement over Grover. 
but not by very much. So for example, for the three set problem, we're only able to show that our algorithm goes like two to the 0 0.4999948n. Um, but as I promised, it is slightly better than Grover's algorithm. And kind of our goal has been to just prove a constant improvement. So this is kind of achieves our goal. Um, but a caveat here is that the best classical algorithm for three sat, all right, this is determining if there is a fully satisfiable assignment um, to uh, a three sat formula is uh, two to the 0 0.39n. And so this is even better than the quantum algorithm, right? And actually this two to the 0 0.39n algorithm can be quadratically sped up using amplitude amplification. So, you know, the, our quantum algorithm is not the best quantum algorithm for this problem, and it doesn't even beat the best classical algorithm. Um, the same is sort of true for the KSAT problem, uh, where we get a slight improvement over the Grover runtime, but classically one can do a little bit better than, uh, than exhaustive enumeration in such a way that our algorithm is a speed up, but not a quadratic, not even a quadratic speed up over the best classical algorithm. Similarly, for the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model, which is a random ensemble of uh, Ising, uh, Ising like interaction, uh, uh, it's like a spin glass, uh, a spin glass ensemble. Um, our algorithm runs better than Grover, but the best classical algorithm based on a branch and bound technique is even better than our quantum algorithm. And finally, for this uh, generalization of the SK model to higher degree interactions called the K-spin model, um, our algorithm runs better than Grover. And actually, in this case, the classical algorithm, uh, there's no, uh, at least known to us, algorithm that runs better than exhaustive enumeration in the exponent. So here we have a super quadratic speedup, at least pending uh, the discovery of a better classical algorithm, which um, could be possible. Um, and we comment on this in the paper. But... Um, uh, you know, so so basically, uh, of all these results, there's only one example where we can um, show that uh, compared to the best classical algorithm, we have a super quadratic speedup, and um, the rest of the cases we have a super Grover speedup, but not a super quadratic speedup. Um, so there's kind of two, yeah. There's two caveats here. One is the the existence of these classical algorithms, and the second one is the fact that the speedups are just in general like very small. So to address the, the small speedups caveat, uh, we did some numerics uh, to kind of determine whether the speedup in practice actually might be much larger than what the analytic proof suggests. And um, here we've done exact diagonalization on some instances with uh, n up to 23. So here's an n equals 20 instance, where you can see that as you increase the b value of your Hamiltonian, the overlap between the intermediate state and the plus state, given in the blue, uh, stays very close to 1. Um, up to a very large value of b, um, indicating that the first jump in our sequence will succeed with high probability. And then secondly, the overlap with the optimal solution is increasing exponentially as we increase b, um, which is a log y-axis. Um, so this is exactly the behavior we expect analytically. And what we can do is we can take a fixed value of b, for example, b equals 0 0.7, generate a bunch of random instances at different values of n, and infer what the runtime would be by taking the overlap of the uh, of the red plot here for all these different instances, um, and then plotting that as a function of n and fitting to a line on a log linear scale. Um, this uh, process suggests that the runtime of the uh, three spin model uh, for these choice of parameters would be two to the zero point four three n. So um, a, a slight improvement over Grover, um, you know, much more than what we were able to show analytically, although not kind of a quartic speed up or anything like this. Um, but it does kind of suggest that the analytics have a lot of room for improvement over what would actually be the case in practice. And then secondly, we um, in this table, we see that uh, there's these classical algorithms that are better. So why would we ever run our algorithm? Or, or why are we interested in our algorithm at all? And the, the key reason that our algorithm is still interesting is because it is based on a fundamentally quantum effect, the kind of way that our algorithm generates a speed up is something that can't be replicated classically. So it's kind of this key ingredient that would be needed in order to go beyond quadratic speed ups, although uh, we're not able to show that we can really go beyond quadratic speed, up, speed ups except in that one case. And here I'd like to explain uh, one kind of uh, phenomenon that's happening that may explain this. Um, and it's that uh, in quantum mechanics, we can have states that are localized in the two norm while being delocalized in the one norm. And our algorithm is exploiting this to give a speed up. So we can see this in the plus minus basis for our intermediate state psi b. Because our intermediate state psi b has high overlap with the plus state, 
uh, this is something we're able to prove. This means that the function wave function is localized when we use the two norm, right? If we compute the two norm overlap for each of these basis states, almost all of the weight is going to be concentrated on the all plus state. However, if we use uh, the one norm, so if we compute the overlap here in this uh, middle part of psi b and all of these basis states x, um, but we don't square it, we find that only an exponentially small fraction of the weight is concentrated on the state, um, uh, the all plus state. This is a consequence of the fact that we have exponentially larger overlap with the uh, bit string z star than we expected. Um, so to say it another way, here we have our three states plus the intermediate state and z star. And the first state is localized in both norms. But the second state is only localized in the two norm, which is what allows us to get there in the first place via phase estimation. Um, and then when we do the final jump, the fact that the second state is delocalized in the one norm is what gives rise to our exponential speed up or our polynomial speed up over Grover's algorithm, the kind of exponential improvement in the amount of weight that um, is applied uh, on the uh, Z star state. So th th these matrix entries are in the plus minus basis here. Okay, so in the time that remains, I'd like to give a few words about how the proof um, proceeds. Um, so there's kind of two ingredients to the proof. The first thing we have to prove is this large excited energy condition that I mentioned before, um, which is basically that the that the Hamiltonian HB still has a fairly large spectral gap. Um, this requires that we impose a tail bound on the number of assignments that achieve a large fraction of the optimal cost value, um, which is something that we can't prove in general, but uh, can be proven, for example, in the specific cases that we um, mentioned in the table of results. And then uh, once we impose that, we use the log Sobolev inequality and some tools from statistical mechanics to complete the proof of the large excited energy condition. I'm not going to go into this in the talk, um, but you can look at the paper to uh, find um, an explanation of this part. The second part is once we've assumed the large excited energy condition, we know that the runtime is going to be given by this expression. And we need to upper bound this expression by an amount that's slightly better than Grover's algorithm. So how do we do that? Um, we take this um, quantity, which is going to be exponentially large, and we um, move it around a little bit. Um, and uh, we can re-express it uh, as upper bounded by this uh, amount that's a, an inverse of the sandwich between the plus state, the projector onto the ground state of HB, and the state Z star. So this is what, you know, what the algorithm is doing. It starts in the plus state, projects onto the ground state of HB, and then projects onto the state Z star. Um, but the annoying thing about this expression is that it includes this ground state projector pi, which is kind of hard to work with, um, as complicated as the Hamiltonian uh, itself, kind of contains all the information. Um, and so we replace pi with an approximate ground state projector PL. Now, approximate ground state projectors have been useful in other contexts, such as um, proving area laws for many body systems. And here, the ground state projector that we choose is just the Hamiltonian HB divided by its ground state energy EB raised to the Lth power. And uh, what does this do? Well, you can see that uh, the ground state of HB will have eigenvalue 1 for this, uh, pro uh, this uh, operator PL. But any other state of HB uh, will have its eigenvalue suppressed uh, by taking the Lth power. So it'd be some, some number less than one to the Lth power. So if you take L large enough, all of these eigenvalues will be close to zero and you'll have an operator that approximates your ground state projector. And what's nice about PL is that it's the sum of, uh, of only two terms. So when we take it to the Lth power, we get a sum of two to the L terms and we can kind of analyze each of these terms individually uh, and lower bound their contribution to the overall sum in the denominator of this expression in in number one, uh, eventually giving us an upper bound on the overlap, uh, on the on the runtime. But at some point, we're going to need to invoke the structure in the cost function h, because so far we've just treated h as a black box. Um, uh, and what structure are we going to exploit? So in all the cases that we can prove uh, things about, we invoke a similar structure related to the locality of the uh, of the cost function h. So here I've given an example where h is a degree three polynomial. All of the terms have degree three. And what this means is that if we take any state, any bit string y, sorry, any bit string z, and we compute the cost function h of z, and then we also uh, compute the average, uh, the average of the costs at all of the neighbors of z. So if we flip all, if we flip a single bit 
of Z and we get to Y and we take the average over all possible bits that we might flip, then the expected value of our energy is not that much different than what we would have had if we didn't flip any bits. So basically, um, uh, you know, if we flip a single bit, we're kind of unlikely to flip a bit in any individual term because each individual term only involves a constant number of variables. And so you can end up with an expression like this. And how do we use that in uh, bounding this um, approximate ground state projector um, uh, expression? So here, our, our numerator of our thing we want to bound is this uh, two-term thing to the lth power. If we take, for example, a, uh, a term with uh, L equals 5, then we have uh, our five factors um, you know, chosen randomly here. Uh, we can see, we can update this expression uh, first by pulling out the two factors of B that appear, um, and then noting that the plus state is an eigenvector with eigenvalue one for the X operator. And so we can just eat two of these X operators um, uh, from the left. Similarly, the Z star state is an eigenvector with eigenvalue one of this diagonal G eta of H operator, so we can eat one of these from the right. And now we have a, a sandwich here uh, where we start in the Z star state on the right. We apply the transverse field X, which flips one bit at random, and then we calculate the energy of the uh, cost function filtered by G eta. This can be re-expressed as a sum over all the neighbors Y of Z star, uh, the energy at those points uh, averaged. So here's where we have to invoke the structure involved in the problem and this property on the previous slide to be able to lower bound this term um, in terms of the um, parameters of the problem. Uh, so this, um, is, this won't work for every possible cost function. It only works for cost functions that have this property I mentioned. OK, so now that, um, now that I've given a bit of the flavor of the proof, I'd just like to conclude by uh, restating what we've shown. Um, so here we've shown a provable super Grover speedup, um, and we've kind of explained why that speedup is kind of inherently quantum um, and can't be obviously replicated in a classical way. Um, this is important because it has the potential to allow us to go beyond quadratic speedups for combinatorial optimization, even though it falls short of going far beyond quadratic speedups in, in any specific cases, except for this one case I mentioned where we haven't really kind of fully classified what the classical complexity is. Secondly, the magnitude of the provable speedup is quite small, but the numerical res results are optimistic that the actual speedup could be larger. And we kind of hope that we can uh, push the theory to kind of uh, make the provable speedups even better in the future. Finally, uh, we can identify a few open questions um, from our work. So first of all, um, can we combine the quantum effect at play here with some of the classical effects that are used to go beyond uh, exhaustive enumeration on the classical side, such as the branch and bound technique um, that was used to improve the uh, classical and quantum algorithms for the SK model. Um, secondly, can we uh, show that there's a super Grover speedup for the max KSAT problem? This is different than the KSAT problem um, because it allows for frustrated, we're kind of, we're looking for the uh, solution that satisfies the most clauses, not whether or not there's a solution that satisfies all the clauses. And this is, would be nice because max KSAT actually is not known to have a better than exhaustive enumeration classical algorithm. So it would be a good place to look for super quadratic speedups that are meaningful um, in practice. And thirdly, uh, could we combine the speedup of our version of this algorithm with the original short path algorithm that Hastings um, suggested to give a potentially even bigger speedup? Okay, that concludes my talk. Um, uh, thank you for watching.